What up, people? 1 p.m. Eastern time, top of the hour. Yes, I'm Guy Adami. Yes, Dan Nathan is here as well. You are watching Market Call. And in just a few brief minutes, EY from SoFi, from the New York Athletic Club, she just won the Heisman <laughs> Trophy, will be joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by our three presenting sponsors, FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. SoFi, get your money right all in one app application to people like me and of course open exchange dan because they manage the virtual minis that matter for the top companies around the world my goodness gracious and it, fe it feels like you know i was born in 1963 i mean i remember the early 1970s dan nathan and i will tell you it's eerily reminiscent how are you well first of all you do not remember the bear market of 1973 74 unless you were like the doogie hauser of trading or something you were the boy plunger as they called it in <laughs> reminiscence of a stock operator and you did trade in that period i think didn't you back when they had ticker tapes that sort of thing yeah, i did yeah a little bit um you know listen this market has been really interesting guy you and i have mentioned this on numerous occasions the stock market that is is that we're going to talk about some of these other risk assets and they've been moving around in with a a velocity that is not always thought about as it relates to rates and currencies and, and commodities, that sort of thing. But, you know, equities have really been, I, I feel like, orderly. I know that the s and is down 11 12%. We know that the NASDAQ at its lows was down 20%, but it didn't really feel like it got there with a bunch of panic. Yeah, we had a day in late January and we had a day in late February, but there were also kind of big reversal days, right? And so this one feels a little bit, it's just like one step forward, two steps back. And, you know, guy, look at this s p chart this is just a year to date and you can see it where on the left that's the open and the, on the right the little tick is on the close of each one of those daily marks here and you see that you know the moves once they started one way they usually would go and finish the day that way and we've had some reversals here but look at that 50 day in purple it's about to cross the 200 day moving average they call that what guy a death cross in the technical uh you know like the aisles of the of the market people it's it's a death cross what does that mean to you that we're seeing the short-term momentum indicator cross below the longer-term one. Well, I'll tell you that now everybody's going to start. I will tell you, you haven't heard it yet. You're hearing it here on Market Call. You will yeah. start to hear it, I'm sure, on a number of different shows over the next few weeks. Typically, before the death crosses, you have a touch and then a subsequent bounce. I would expect that as well. But uh, to your point, it doesn't augur particularly well for the broader market. And I think you made an excellent point saying, you know what? The sell-off in the broader market has been exactly that orderly. There hasn't really been panic to the downside. I would submit the panic you've seen over the last couple of weeks has been to the upside. I think you saw that yesterday. And today, it appears to be a bit of an orderly sell-off. I think this thing exhausts itself when the VIX goes north of 40. We haven't seen that yet, but we'll talk about it. But this is a chart that should be on your radar screen because you know what, folks? Everybody is going to start to talk about it now. Just so happens that Dan, once again, is ahead of the curve. Yeah, but you make a great point, guy, about the panic buying on those reversal days, on the you know reversing a few down days in a row. And I'll just say this: from our experience trading in bear markets, and we're not going to tell you that we're in a bear market here, but the price action and a lot of the stuff that we see and a lot of different risk assets might suggest that equities are about to be in one that might take some time for it to work out here. If we look at the one-year chart of the S&P 500, this is one of the one where we drew the lines. You see that downtrend here. You you could see if we were to kind of have a spike low like we had in January and February, that could get us back to 4,000. The high in the S&P 500 was about 4,800 or so. You do the math on that, that gets you to the high teens, peak to trough. And I don't think we're done going uh, down there. But we got to look at one stock guy because it's one that we talk about a lot. It's one you kind of hate. And I kind of hate You know why I hate it? Because everybody loves it. It's like yeah. the Dallas Cowboys. But anyway, yeah. please continue. Well, I have a love-hate relationship with one, this one. And if you look at this Apple chart, you know, from the start of 2021, this one over the last six months or so is what I would call the, what, triangle of death. guy. Oh. I think I coined that on Fast Money back in like 2014 or something like that. At the time, you almost fell off your chair here. But look at this thing, man. It's breaking below that breakout level, right, from the fall, which was the prior high um, from the summer or September or so, you see that 200 day moving average down there. The stock is down four and a quarter percent right now. Um, that's not lost on me, man. If that were to kind of pick up some steam, you're going to have the S&P follow suit quick 
take on my triangle of death in Apple. The only thing worth, worse than a death cross is, in fact, the triangle of death, and we're in it right now. And I think, listen, we've talked about this for a while, and that moved down to 152 a few weeks ago. Uh, the 200-day moving average at the time was 151.60. Huge reversal. You saw the subsequent bounce over the next few days. But I think we're in it right now. And when I say we're in it, I think now Apple – is starting to feel the pressure of the broader market. It's sort of the last man or woman standing, and here we are. I would submit, Dan, that we're going to break the 200-day, and I will tell you that the lows we saw back in October of 137 and a half or so should be on everybody's radar screen. So I think it goes lower from here. And what we haven't mentioned yet, and I just bring up, just to bring it up, yeah. because you have to think about it, it's something that we call tail risk. You're starting to hear a lot of chatter about U.S.-China sanctions and those types of things. I will tell you, if something were to manifest itself between the United States and China along those lines, Apple will be taken out to the woodshed. Again, I've never had a woodshed. I'm not yeah. sure what it means, but that's where it's going to go. Yeah, but there's three things you got to focus on there. So it's one, it's assembly, you know, of their actual finished products is the other one is the components right and then the other one is demand you know mm -hmm. like some national demand and so if they were to like say there was some sort of dust up let's say you know they say that they actually set the precedent by not selling in russia anymore and they do the same in china well there's a much bigger percentage of their revenues so to me i'm with you guy that could be um a big problem you said last man or woman standing i was thinking the last fruit standing all right here's one that we got to focus on because the headline overnight amazon is launching um a buy buyback um, and a 20 for one stock split. And what's interesting here is that Andy Jazzy, the new CEO, only the second CEO the company has ever had, you and I have been saying this for months and months that he will be putting his own stamp on this company the same way Satya Nadella did when he took over, um, you know, 10 years ago or whatever at Microsoft and then Sundar Pichai at Google. And then obviously the big one is Tim Cook. One of the first things that Tim Cook did at Apple is he launched a massive buyback and a dividend back in 2012. And you think, about it that company has bought back you ready for this a half a trillion dollars worth of their own stock or so and tens and tens of billions of dollars in dividends and so this one you know is below i mean it was six feet under you see that line there over the last you know year or so guy and it just kind of popped um above that what's your take on this i think the i think you'll agree with me the buyback is probably more important than the stock split well, I mean, what I'll say about a $10 billion buyback, I'm sure we've all been in the ocean. And my sense is, unless you're lying to yourself, you've, we've all relieved ourselves in the ocean. And that's effectively what one or this two is. or both. What are you no, talking about? No, that would be here? number one, Dan. My okay. point is, it's like it makes no difference whatsoever. I hear EY chuckling in the background because she knows I'm oh, my right. Mic I is mean, on? My mic a is $10 on. billion dollar buyback for <laughs> Apple, for Amazon, is a joke when it's a one and a half trillion dollar. Yeah, but I think, Guy, but you would, you would agree. When Google back then, and they were called Google, they were an alphabet back then, when Ruth Porat came over from Morgan Stanley as a CFO, I think we probably had the same exact commentary about their buybacks. And you got to start some way. You got to start some way. No, that's yeah. fair. And I yeah. shouldn't have used that crass uh, example. I'll say this because I know where I was. The day that Facebook reported and got obliterated, the next day, everybody was selling Amazon. It just so happened that on that day, Amazon reported after the bell. And they came out with what was an okay quarter at best, and they actually guided lower. Now, the stock traded up to 33.50 that day after closing, I think, with a 29.50 or so handle. And everybody was saying what an amazing quarter it was. And what I said, and I think you said it as well, it wasn't an amazing quarter. It's an amazing stock reaction. But let's not get carried away here, folks. And we actually thought it would go back down. Here we are. Got down, I think, to 27.50 or so. That's been the support level. You drew the lines. The lines draw yeah. themselves, as you say, Dan. So I actually think Amazon's going to be a huge second half story. And I think you can get long the stock here, regardless of what's going on in the broader market. Yeah, right? I actually think you'll probably see 2,500 before you see, you know, another, I don't know, 400 points up. But that's just my take. And I'll tell you why I think that. If you look at the NDX here, and we know that the top five names make up, what, 25% or so of that index. If we were to see Apple really go down to that 137 level, then the NDX guy is about to take a dirt nap, man. You think Wait, about excuse me. Slow the, down. A dirt Please nap. Please say a you dirt nap. It. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this thing is going to break that support at 13,000. And we probably then go test those lows from last March. And then who knows, you know, you tell me, is it 11,000 or something? And I think it could happen over time. I don't think we're going to crash. I don't think it's going to be one day or two days or anything like that. It just seems there's a lot of excess that needs to be taken out. And the other point, the last point I'll make about the NDX here is it did have a death cross uh, yes. on March 1st. Thank and, you. And That's exactly down. right. Correct, correct, correct. Um, all right, well, lastly, uh, on this little theme here, guy, that we're doing, and, and I don't know if you'll kind of notice a theme here, look at this snowflake. And this one's really important because you identified this prior to their earnings report. It was trading north of like 30 times sales or something at the point, and at its highs, now this thing is down almost 50%. I think it made a high of 400, and you can do the math here where the stock is trading right now. It's more than 50% at this point. It's about to make a new low, or it feels like it's going to, and you know what? When I look at some of these recent IPOs and you look at the way that they were priced um, in only in 2021, these stocks were born into a grave, man. They were never, ever going to be able to grow into these valuations. And a lot of people that I know in VC who invest in these SaaS models and were okay with those valuations of the private markets, they're scratching their heads and saying, what the hell is going on here? But I just love your take on that really quickly. Well, people will say these are bad companies. Given us the, No, they're not bad companies. Yeah. They're great companies that two stocks got out of control at the end of last year into the seasonality of year end. Um, and that's really all it was, Dan Nathan. So I'm with you. I mean, they're just coming back down to some semblance of normalcy. And we weren't splitting the atom. And by the way, on the way up, I'm sure we were both pointing out that valuations didn't make sense. But there was a paradigm shift. And again, I actually evoked uh, Liz Young the other day on CNBC's Fast Money when I talked about her saying now it's a market where you sell rallies instead of buy sell off. She's been spot on. And it all changed back in late November. So this will find its equilibrium. I just don't think we're there yet. Actually, matter of fact, I don't even think we're remotely close to being there yet. All right. Well, on that note, guys, should we bring the yeah. aforementioned Can I bring Liz her in? Young in? Yeah, because, I mean, I want to see, Liz, I know you're there. Hello. Because I, I heard you giggling in the background. <laughs> um, I won't ask you if you've ever done it before because that's not gentleman you love me. But you are at the New York Athletic Club. I mean, isn't that where they like, did the Heisman Trophy Awards for so long? I mean, you could strike a Heisman pose, pose for us just now if you want. Just sort of throw it out there. I'll do yeah. one real quick. There you go. Good, Back hey, to you. Good for you. Good for you. Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> have I ever done it before? Yeah, in multiple oceans. There you I go. I mean, who hasn't? Yeah, right? thank you for being – I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but I've never won a Heisman. No. Um, so – and this background for everybody is actually real. I know it looks fake, but it is real. <laughs> And the sun is uh, shining very brightly on my face. Apparently, it's always sunny at the NIAC. Of course it is. But, all right, let's talk about a couple things. So the market where it is right now, you know what? I, I agree with you guys. I don't think we've seen all of it. I don't think we've seen all of the downdraft. I think that there's still some pain that needs to be had, especially in other sectors, right? Like we need to see a flush that is completely through all of the sectors. And I don't mean that energy is going to fall off a cliff. I'm going to take energy out of this for now, because I think that's just behaving independently from the rest of the market. But I think we need to see a stronger flush. And and I hate saying that when the S&P is already down 11%, but the reality of it is that we came into this pretty fragile. And we came into this in a place where we were worried about a tightening cycle. We were worried about headwinds on valuations. We were worried about slowing growth, slowing earnings, all of those things. None of those worries have gone away. In fact, they've probably gotten stronger in some cases. So even if you know we see de-escalation in this war, de-escalation in any of the conflict that's going on, now we're adding on concerns of long-term effects, right? Long-term effects on commodities, long-term effects on energy, long-term effects on an entire country being closed off from the West. So uh, I don't think we're done with it. And I think that the Fed has an even harder job ahead of it now, especially with where the yield curve is. Yeah, so let's talk. We're going to get to yield curve because your note uh, on SoFi's blog today is all about that, and we're going to talk about that. But let's talk about this 10-year U.S. Treasury yield because Guy and I, we started out the week on Market Call on Monday talking about a 10-year that looked like it was headed back towards that 200-day uh, moving average guy that was, what, 1.5? three mm -hmm. or so you see that uptrend on that chart here you also see it kind of contending with some of that technical resistance and listen again you know why are we pulling up technical resistance
existence on a 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. Guy, you say it all the time. This should be the most liquid instrument on the planet here, but it's definitely been volatile over the last couple of months. What's your take on that volatility, Guy? Because you know what? You would have been saying 2% on the 10-year. You thought it could pull back. You thought we'd see the 210 spread get to about 30 basis points. We've gotten there. We're going to leave the inversion uh, conversation for Liz, but what's your take on this recent volatility? Well, I mean, it's been volatile for a while. I mean, we've talked about the volatility in 10-year yields, which we shouldn't see. Um, we wouldn't see one twentieth of the volatility that we're seeing, but we are. Why? Because, again, I'm going to rail against the machine here. The Fed's lost control. They control the front end of the curve. I'll give them that. They don't control anything else. And the market is struggling to figure it out. Today's move is on the back of that 7.9% CPI print. But I will tell you, Dan, that if the market continues to sell off, this will do a huge reversal, and you'll see yields right back down as the flight to quality goes back into the bond market. Somewhat counterintuitive, but that's what we're seeing. And again, you brought up two tens. I'd love to hear Liz's take on it, but that got down to what, the 22 basis points or so. And I'm pretty much pretty convinced it's going to go negative in the short term, short term being over the next couple of months. All right, Liz, so, it's your time to shine, pal. Uh, hey, I'm ready. I mean, I'm sh <laughs> the, the sun is making me shine no matter what I say, but... All right. What I wrote about this week was the inversions and why we talk about curve inversions and we look at the spread between the twos and the tens. Why does it matter? Now, first of all, what we're looking at here is a chart of how much it's compressed over a really short period of time. I mean, we were up at 160 basis points in spread just earlier in 2021. And now we're down in the, the mid to high 20s, right? We got down to the low 20s. Why do we care? Why does it matter? Because most of the time, a curve inversion precedes a recession. This is another one of those indicators, much like oil prices. A spike in oil prices usually precedes a recession. Now we're getting close to ticking the boxes on two of those indicators. So when some of these signals start to make noise, that's when you have to pay attention. And you usually we get ahead of it. You know, we, the recession happens. We look back and we say, oh yeah, that's right, that did happen. How come we didn't talk about that more? How come we didn't notice that? How come we didn't believe it when it was happening? So let's watch it and believe it. And here's the other thing, why I think this is really important is because I don't think the Fed cares very much about the equity market. Contrary to popular belief, I don't think they're gonna come in and save it. I don't think that matters, but they do care about the yield curve and they are probably going to try to fix it if we invert. now. My question, I'm going to give this to Dan, actually, uh -oh, is okay. the definition of inversion, right? So you could have an inversion that happens intraday. We could see an inversion that's like five basis points intraday, but we still close uninverted. Or what if you have an inversion that lasts three to five days? Does that count as a signal? Uh, you know, it, it depends. I think, I, as Guy just mentioned, how you get there. And I just think about the last two times we saw the 210 um, invert, Liz. And, you know, it was really back in 2006, right before, you know, a year before the market topped out. And then the next year we had a recession. And then the last time we had it invert was 2019. And you know what happened there, right? In 2020. And again, you know, we got Nostradami on the market call here today. And he's been calling for You like that, right? He's been calling for all of this stuff but my point is is like if we're market prognosticators right i don't i'm not an economist and guy what do you say you're not like you're not humorless enough to be an economist or smart enough or whatever i don't know jack about that stuff all i know is when some of these things start to happen here the stock market goes down and i'll kick it back to guy right now guy you made this point really well it's like man we're not playing in the stock market if you're getting bearish playing for a recession sometimes it's the stock market going down that actually pushes on the recession. Look, I could do an hour-long solo show about how screwed they are. And now that the Federal Reserve is... Yeah, I think yesterday, by the way, was the last day they're buying stuff. So think about that. They can no longer do anything about the 10... God only knows how many 10-year bonds they were buying to try to, you know, to try to do their best with interest rates. And now here we are. So what can they do to stop the inversion? Absolutely nothing is what they can do. Because again... The back end is going to take care of itself. They're no longer going to be buying assets, I think, and they're going to let stuff roll off. This is not a this is not a particularly pleasant picture that I'm painting. I think for the bond market, we'll see. What I will say though, quickly before we go to some individual names, Dan, you failed to mention the most uh, important inversion of all time, and of course that was Maverick was inverted over a Mig uh, 17. 
Uh, and then it was a bullshit, but it actually was true. They took a picture. Back to you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, that was obviously the Iceman who was calling BS on that. But we know that it happened. All right, Liz, give us a little bit of history here. This goes back to 77. Guy was already in the markets a couple of decades at that point, back to 77. It's also the year that Star Wars came out, which Guy Adami has never seen, which is kind of odd to me. Tell us what you're seeing here with this 210 uh, spread chart. I've never seen Star Wars either. There you uh, go. But, okay, a little history. So as you can see on this chart, when it inverts, there is in fact a recession that follows. I will define an inversion as something that persists. So intraday doesn't count. Three days doesn't count. I would even argue one week doesn't count. And if it's super shallow, like 10 basis points, doesn't count as a signal. I think it was a coincidence that we had a mini inversion and then we had the 2020 recession. I think that was a completely exogenous shock that had nothing to do with the curve inverting. If it is inverted for a month, this is completely Liz Young definition. This is no scientific nothing. Some people say three months. I think if it's inverted for a month, that counts as a signal. And then historically, the recession comes somewhere between, say, 12 and 18 months later. So even if it does invert, you've got time. And the market usually rises between that inversion and the actual recession itself, if it's just a financial recession because of imbalances in the market. So you do have some time. So let's say the Fed inverts the curve in the next few months. Okay, I don't know that that's really the end of the world. Also, let's even take the worst side of that. Let's say the Fed puts us into a recession and they know they put us into a recession. It's a shallow one that we don't find out about until a month after it's over, right? Because that's when you get GDP numbers. It takes care of inflation. We come out of it and things are a little bit more balanced. So I think we need to also get rid of the idea that recessions are this sort of death wish that everybody would have. I don't think recessions would be that bad if it was something that fixed some of the imbalances we have. You see me nodding my head here in agreement. By the way, Death Wish, a great movie with Charles Bronson. And you're right. Recession's not a four-letter world. It's a natural part of the business cycle. We just don't allow them to happen because, quite frankly, you can't run a political campaign on saying, and oh, by the way, under my administration, we're going to suffer through a recession. It's as simple as that, which is why these Fed geniuses have done everything they can to avoid one. Anyway, Dan, I'm sorry. Please continue. Well, I, I mean, the other point is, and Liz, we talked about this last week when we were discussing the potential for an inversion. It, it's also the sort of thing where the stock market is likely to kind of actually had most of the damage done before they're officially calling it a recession, which would be two yeah. consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. All right, let's talk about industrials, though, because this was a group we highlighted last week, um, Liz, and you know, you thought it would, they would clearly underperform if the expectations for a recession were rising. Guy, there's two names, though. This is our kind of animal loving section of the MKT call here, the, the, the cat tractor and the deer, these two names have had a wicked bounce of late. You know, if you look at this cat chart here, it was making new 52 week lows just a few weeks ago. And you see that violent rally here it just got above its 200 day moving average. Um, and you know, it's still in a bit of a downtrend, but this is one, I mean, I personally would kind of look to fade and then real quickly deer. If you look at this one here, it's been in this consolidation phase. It's pretty wide consolidation phase. Briefly made a new um, all-time high there. It's come back um, a little bit here. What's your take on these two names? And then let's look at the XLI after that, which is the you know uh, ETF that tracks the industrial space. And maybe Liz can give us a little refresher there on her thoughts because that one looks a little different than these two charts that these companies are both in that ETF. The XLI looks like it's rolling over. These look like they're basin. I agree with you on Caterpillar, although I don't think you're going to miss it on the upside. I think John Deere is building a base that we building a base. It's building the sort of the sideways action until we go to yeah. the next level higher, I believe. You can make a compelling case for both of these names on valuation. But, but what do they both have in common? And Liz and I and you were talking about this prior to this show. Agriculture and mining. And don't think for a minute that's not what's going on here. I mean, we talk about gold and silver, talking about base metals. I don't even get into wheat. But wheat, as we sit here, has been making all-time highs. And, oh, by the way, I think the largest producer of wheat in the world is U is Russia. I think one of the second largest is Ukraine. So I mean, we can go on and on as the reasons why. But I think John Deere is about to break out. I think Caterpillar is going to give you a chance. But I think that's what's going on in both names. 
Fair enough. All right, Liz, let's take a look at this XLI here, the ETF that tracks the industrial space. Amanda drew the line there. You see that 200-day moving average that it's been below um, for the better part of this year of 2022, but it really does feel like it's kind of rolling over. It has a different look and feel to those two components of it. Just, you know, what's your take on, on industrials again here? Well, you have to think about what is made up of industrials, right? What's under the surface? And there's airlines in there. You've got airlines, you've got... Yeah travel stocks that things that are dependent on travel and obviously the airlines have gotten hit in this past couple weeks we've got gas prices rising jet fuel prices are going to rise airline ticket prices have risen so as the travel industry gets hit you're going to see airlines get hit which i think is what's mostly bringing down the industrial sector but back to cat and deer i mean also i grew up in wisconsin we all know this i have seen a lot of cats and a lot of deer mm. and i actually have a really good video of a, a deer tractor i was driving down a country road in wisconsin this is no joke and it drove past me as fast as a car it was it's hilarious i'll put it on twitter so I've done it before. please that is it's amazing. so good it's amazing um but you can't ignore the fact that there's going to be companies and there's going to be industry groups in every sector that are going to act differently from the broad sector. And I said this yeah. earlier in the year, I'm going to continue to say it as the year goes on. This is not a year where you can buy broad market beta. It's just not. You can't yeah. buy big baskets anymore. You have to be choosy. And as a strategist, the choosiest I can get is at that industry group level or the sub-industry group level. And this is a perfect example of that. This is a time when you don't wanna be in airlines, yeah. but you do wanna be maybe in heavy machinery. That makes sense. All right, we're gonna get choosy here, or, or a couple of analysts got choosy um, in the cybersecurity space, um, in the telecom equipment space. Real quickly, we wanna hit CrowdStrike. This was a stock that Guy Adami on Fast Money, and I believe on Market Call earlier on the week, he thought you could trade it to the long side. He thought near term there was a much enough damage in this name into their earnings print um and it had a big bounce it's up uh, i think more than 13 percent today it gets upgraded from btig guy dami give it to me real quickly because the flip side of that as well as fargo downgrade cisco to equal weight they'd rather be in some of the growthier names now here's the thing dude you know crowdstrike with a 45 billion dollar market cap here okay it basically trades at 20 sometimes earnings or something like that it is not cheap they did what they needed to do i just worry that you know you have the report it squeezes some shorts but you might go back and kind of fill in that gap a little bit and then on the on the cisco side i'll just say it's kind of a cheap stock expected at mid to high single digits earnings and sales growth you know trading well below a market multiple i don't know exactly that's how i'd want to trade the market that we're in right now yeah you nailed the wells fargo cisco call so i'll leave that as is in terms of the crowd strike look i wish btig did this earlier see that was a test by the way by a crack producer, Amanda, to make sure I'm paying attention. It is, in fact, BTIG. I did catch it. And listen, I wish they had done it earlier because I thought the setup and the earnings were great. You know, don't it doesn't really help me a whole hell of a lot to put these things out post-earnings. I get understand why analysts will do that. But to your point, it's not a cheap stock, but it's a lot cheaper than it was a few months ago, both in price and in valuation. And this was a good quarter. I do think it could get up to that 200-day moving average, which comes in around 230. A lot of the damage was done to the downside. We talked about that. We said the setup looked great, especially given the fact that this space is in play. So although valuations matter, I don't think they matter as much in the cyber names, Dan Nathan. All right, dude. I, I mean, listen, I'm just going to tee you up because you're the one who normally gets really excited. Where do we go from here, guy? What, what, well, how do we close out market? I mean, come on. I, can, I, can, I like to do it. By the way, um, the XLI, I know we're on a clock here. The fifth largest component, I think, from memory is Boeing. And we haven't talked about Boeing in a while. But that has been a shit show. Anyway, oh. well, yeah, well, it's true. Uh, what do we do at this point? We go to Butters. <laughs> One man, that was bang. You see the way they changed the slide just yeah. as I said, Butters. One for the road. Guess what, Dan? 76% of companies have cited inflation on their earnings call. Go figure. I mean, what a shock to me. Take back to you, Dan Nathan. Yeah, well, listen, we just got that February CPI print 7.9. I think it was, what, 7.1 or 2 for um, January. And, you know, at this point, we are through most of the S&P 500. I think we're losing Dan. Dan, I, and I'm going to take it from here because you're, you're buffering, as they say. Everybody, what's that? I know that you like to... 
No, no, no. I, I'm not interrupting you. You were buffering. That's an old term. Oh, I used I'm to have sorry my about dial that. I'm no, sorry. But, All right. Go ahead. So it's going to be a Q1. It's going to be a Q1 earnings story here, and that's why we watch John Butter's earnings insight um, blog that he sends out every Friday morning. We get a preview of it, and here's the deal, man. I mean, this is going to be something that a company is going to have very poor visibility as they give Q2 guidance if they're able to give it for the balance of the year. Surging dollars not helping. The uncertainty around interest rate is certainly not helping here. So, um, to me, I don't think that we've heard the worst from companies, and we were supposed to have heard the worst from companies right now because. We're supposed to be in the endemic, guy, Dami. Yeah. And it was all supposed to be transitory. But you know what's not transitory? My affection, my love, my sincere admiration of the work that EY from SoFi does. So as we get out of here, I want to say thank you to EY from SoFi because that's it for today's market call. I want to thank FactSet, the aforementioned SoFi, and Open Exchange. And let me tell you something, people. If you're not checking out Liz Young on Twitter, as I've said a hundred times, you're doing it wrong at Liz Young Strat. And please sign up for SoFi's daily newsletter at SoFi.com. I think it's a backslash, but it's the one that goes like this daily to read Liz's articles every Thursday. Be sure, and I'm telling you, Monday, God only knows what's going to happen. It's a Beach Boys song. Turn in on Monday, 1 p.m., market call. We are Audi 3750.